in the glow of each other's majestic presence. December 14th, 2012. This is the Quiet Bubble Podcast by Walter Biggins, episode 18. I saw Lincoln about a week ago. I loved it. I argued with it. I worried over it. In part, I think that I loved it exactly because it encourages argument and anxiety. Uh, Argument over the role of electoral politics in our lives. The argument over political machinations among government elites that the people who elected these elites, after all, never get to see. Uh, Anxiety over centrism versus radicalism uh, in both the Democrat and the Republican parties. arguments over defining race and citizenship in this country, and who gets to make those definitions in the first place. The aura of Abraham Lincoln permeates the movie, even in scenes he's not in, and there are more of those than you would expect. His presence looms, wise and canny and melancholic, over the movie, rattling the characters around him. Uh, Lincoln is as much about the image of Lincoln, Lincoln as an icon, as it is about Lincoln as a person, Lincoln as a deeply troubled, flawed man. Uh, Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner's gift is in showing both the icon and the man as w- at once, as well as they can, anyway, during the process that Lincoln was becoming an iconic figure. Another surprise is that... Uh, Lincoln is funnier as a movie than I expected it to be. One great running joke throughout the movie is that Lincoln keeps launching into these long-winded stories and jokes, and people around him get exasperated in the process. There's a sense of Lincoln as old hat, as there's a a been-there-done-that sense about how he's treated by the other characters in the movie, even during his presidency. His iconography is undercut whenever possible, and then Lincoln surprises you by earning his status a millisecond later. In short, he's a legend in his own time, already sort of becoming an iconic figure even as he's serving the country. You only get that sense because Daniel Day-Lewis, duh, is phenomenal. Uh, But so are all of the actors around him. Tommy Lee Jones, Lee Pace, James Spader, John Hawks, Tim Blake Nelson, Gloria Rubin, Sally Field, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. In a way, the supporting roles are livelier, quirkier, more human, and thus more surprising than Lincoln himself. They, uh, they're more relatable, in a sense. Um, but again, and I have to say it again, da- Daniel Day-Lewis is phenomenal. I never sensed that I was watching a performance or a look-at-me exercise in mimicry, as I often feel while watching Sean Penn. Uh, Day Lewis's Lincoln swings from dry patience to deep sadness to quicksilver wit, usually in the same scene and sometimes in the same sentence. Um, Lincoln is a film of dualities, of competing visions uh, Republicans versus Democrats, radicals versus conservatives, even within the same party, ameliorators versus avengers, even amongst u- Union troops. Uh, the Confederacy, of course, is particularly concerned with the possibility of the North taking revenge against the South. Uh, The opening pair of sequences in the movie lines up these concerns beautifully. Um, The film basically cold opens on a daytime, grisly battle. Less explosions and gunfire than bayonet stabs and punches to the face. More close-ups of frightened faces and mud and blood-streaked uniforms than there are sweeping panoramas of a campaign in action. It's rousing, and it's terrifying, but it doesn't last long. After about a minute of this reminder that Lincoln presided over a war, the film immediately cuts to a nighttime scene that's as calm and stately and glowingly lit as the previous scene was nerve-wracky, shaky, and grimy. The cut moves from battle, uh, black Union soldiers grappling with white Confederates, to two black soldiers talking face-to-face to the, at this point, unseen Abraham Lincoln. They're telling of their deeds in the battle, and subtly praising their battalion specifically as a black battalion. The soldiers are friends. One of them, to the left of the frame of Lincoln's field of vision, is clearly awestruck by the great emancipator. His partner, to Lincoln's right, respects Lincoln, to be sure, but you can see in his face, and you can hear in the tone of his voice, 
that he wants to use this rare opportunity to abdicate on, beh on behalf of the Negroes in the Union, and Negroes more generally in the nation. He keeps interrupting his friend's um, awestruck palaver, clearly annoyed by his friend's uh, sycophancy, but trying not to show it, trying not to look uppity or disrespectful in the presence of the president. During this conversation, two white soldiers interrupt. So now we have two pairs in the same frame, one white, one black. They're also awestruck, but more, there's no better way to say it, simple-minded. They've memorized the Gettysburg Address and recite it, but they haven't actually internalized it. Spielberg makes this point clear because the boys begin to forget the speech around the time it starts talking about reconciliation and the potential for racial equality. Uh, the black soldiers pick up the torch, um, reciting more of the speech, and the more militant one finishes the speech as he's walking back to his unit, in a tone that's at once reverent for the speech, and at the same time rebuking Lincoln for not keeping up his end of the speech, of not practicing governmentally what he preaches. Now, when I first saw this scene, I, I thought, as do several critics apparently, that it was a deadening, flat way to open the movie. The more I think of it, though, the more it haunts me, the more I think it's the key to understanding the movie. Dualities are important, critical, throughout Lincoln. In the fiercest debate, Lincoln and Thaddeus Stevens, Tommy Lee Jones, um, argue over the 13th Amendment. This entire movie is about the 13th Amendment. Stevens, a hardcore abolitionist, believes, rightly, that, ne that Negroes or are equal in every way to whites. He thinks that Lincoln's amendment, which merely defines Negroes and white as, quote, equal under the eyes of the law, end quote, is too measured, too ameliorating to conservatives, too soft, uh, too much out of line with what the actual Declaration of Independence, uh, what the intent of that document uh, is. Lincoln uses the metaphor of a compass in true north to argue that his version of the bill is the only one likely to pass, um, and that if some version of it doesn't, mat doesn't pass, what does it matter that Stevens is morally more right? Uh, the debate tellingly takes place in quiet, not in public, in a kitchen storage area amidst used cutlery and kitchen utensils. Not in public. That's key here. We see the public in the private Lincoln and where they join up and where they depart. We see the public and private face of politics. The congressmen and the, are ever conscious of reporters of how they'll look to their constituents of saving public face while serving private interests. But we also see how backroom dealing, which is after all the majority of this movie, becomes public law. So effectively we don't just see black and white, but the all-important gray in between. Those gray streaks, remember the colors of the Confederate uniform, after all, those gray streaks and mud and the flattened red of blood all come back at the end of Lincoln. After the 13th Amendment passes, Lincoln surveys a battlefield strewn with blown-apart corpses and hollowed-out land. The camera lingers as Lincoln's eyes must have lingered on the awful carnage, in long tracking shots and steady landscape shots. The sequence doesn't last long, just long enough to serve as a bookend to remind us of where this movie started. The glowing backlighting, dramatic angles, and unfussy but fluid interior camera work of the majority of the movie, well, that's the political dealing, isn't it? It hides the horror and violence of war. Maybe the politics helps end it, but as Spielberg and Kushner have the politicians point out repeatedly to Lincoln, it's also the politics of the thing that enable the violence, that make it necessary in the first place. After surveying the battle remains, Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant sit on a porch. Grant reflects that Lincoln looks to have aged a decade in the last year, and that maybe he needed to see this. Lincoln doesn't exactly respond to Grant, but his unwavering gaze tells us the truth. Michael Ventura, uh, writing in a column called The Lincoln, Lincolns of Hollywood, uh, says the following. 
And now we have Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, with its brilliant depiction of the struggle to pass the 13th Amendment. The single most important piece of legislation in our history, it welded the Constitution to the Decor Declaration of Independence, to state legally that blacks and whites were equal before the law was to open the gates for the legal equality of men and women, straights and gays, everyone. It is a lesson the country needs now, and Spielberg can't be praised enough for teaching it. But is this Lincoln? Daniel Day-Lewis's statue come to life performance deserves all praise, but Tony Kushner's script gives us a Lincoln who never loses an argument, persuades anyone he confronts, and gets his way in all things, eyes agleam with secret wisdom, an uber Lincoln, impossible for a viewer to resist. Okay, I cited that long Ventura passage because I think Michael Ventura articulates very clearly what the movie is about and what it's not. Um, despite the protestations otherwise, Lincoln is not a biopic. It is very much focused on the passage of the 13th Amendment, the one that prohibits slavery. It is not intended to give a sense of every important moment of Lincoln's life. There's not even any flashbacks in the movie. It is very much about a single month, January of 1865, uh, in which Lincoln works hard to procure votes to pass an amendment that helps to articulate the promise of, this, of the country's founding fathers and how this country's further documents and law and actions have failed to meet up to those standards. In this sense, though, Lincoln uh, comes a good 80 to 90 years into his presidency after the Founding Fathers uh, and the signing of the Declaration of Independence, that Lincoln is, is in many ways a Founding Father, in that he yoked the traditions and the uh, political and moral philosophies uh, intent that were intended in the Founding Fathers documents um, to actual law. He tries to get us to live up to our standards um, and largely succeeds, at least in the passing of this document, or paves the way for future success. So in that sense, the 13th Amendment, Spielberg and Kushner argue, is in some ways where this country actually begins, actually begins to find its way in a way that's distinct from what had come before. But I also cited Ventura's passage because I'm not sure I agree with it. There are at least four moments. One, the porch exchange with Ulysses S. Grant. Two, the contretemps with Thaddeus Stevens in the kitchen supply area. Three, Lincoln's continued trouble interactions with his son Robert, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who desperately wants to jo join the Union war effort and thinks, perhaps rightly, that the president's son shouldn't be exempt from service. And four, in a backroom exchange late in the film that ends with Lincoln yelling, not arguing, that he is clothed in immense power and you will procure me these votes. It's a moment, that fourth one, where he doesn't so much win an argument, but sidesteps it with um, bluster and stories. He does this a surprising amount throughout the movie, um, sidestepping with uh, and appealing to emotion uh, and with... Uh, storytelling force that maybe lacks logical sense. And in this sense, Lincoln comes across as realistic, as realistic as he can under the circumstances. A man who has moral right on his side, but maybe not, and he knows it, legal weight in equal measure. But ultimately, we can't quite know Lincoln in the same way that we can't quite know icons. They pass beyond being persons to becoming images larger than any single person. Daniel Day-Lewis gets at the enigma of the man with his high-pitched, reedy voice, the retreating gestures despite his looming size, his hobbled and melancholy walk. Spielberg and cinematographer Janusz Kaminski, Kaminski half-bathe the man in shadow, even in well-lit and sunny rooms, as if to emphasize his hidden nature. He was a man, but he's an icon, an enigma, a mystery that looms larger than life, 
but that prods us to live up to our best selves, even when he wasn't always capable of it. He's bigger than us now. He was bigger than us then. And Lincoln, the movie, captures that. Honorably and wisely.